Good afternoon and welcome to today's installment of the Boost Your Skills webinar series, where we enlist the advice of specialist experts in order to help you make the most out of your university experience and to acquire the skills to help you succeed and develop both professionally and on a personal level. I'm Siddharth and joining me is Jenny and we are your Boost Your Skills team. This event will be in webinar format, so you will not be able to turn on your cameras and mics, but we would still love to hear from you through the chat function. This is a safe space with no judgments being passed, so please feel free to ask questions without fear or worry. If you are anxious, feel free to message Jenny or myself anonymously, and we will pass it on. In order to get the full experience of this workshop, please do interact where possible. The session will be followed by some time for Q&A, so please send any questions into the chat box and we will attempt to get through all of them. The event is being live streamed to our YouTube channel, so don't worry if you miss something. We will be sharing a link to the video and slides after the event. A big thank you to all our attendees who pre-submitted questions. Today, we are very pleased to introduce Alan Smith OB, who is the Head of Visual and Data Journalism at the Financial Times. He's an experienced presenter whose TEDx talk was a TED.com featured talk. He was awarded an OBE in 2011 for services to official statistics. And his book, How Charts Work, published by Pearson, is now available on your student store with a 15% discount. We'll put the link in the chat. So now, without any further delay, Here's Alan. Great, thanks Siddharth and hello to everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to join you for this session uh, looking at how charts work. Um, I'm biased, I love charts. It's what I do every day for my, for my living. So, um, but I do hope that I'll convey some of that enthusiasm uh, to yourselves because um, improving the way that we present information is becoming increasingly important. And, you know, regardless of whether that's, uh, you know, how to, communicate during a COVID pandemic or during any of these kind of major global events, um, being able to understand and communicate data is so important. Um, and so what I've planned for this session is I'm going to take you on a tour through some of the considerations that come across our um, uh, path when we're considering how to produce charts in a busy newsroom and how to do it at pace and with high quality, because I think those skills are very transferable in so many different onward uh, career paths. So um, um, to get started, so much of this session is going to be about the power of visuals and how we how visuals can really help us understand information. I thought we should all collectively warm up to start with. So I've got a um, I've got a little kind of warm up exercise here for you, um, and what I'm about to show you is the visual. And guess what I'm going to ask you to do with this. That's right, I'm gonna ask you to just spot the difference between these two photos. And if you want to, you can maybe just enter the chat, you can pop um, some, if you spot a difference between the two photos, just tell us in the chat, the tree, right? Yes, yeah, so there's a tree that's uh, on the left-hand side, the branch is hanging down. Any other any other uh, differences? Yes, there's some people, well done, uh, Phoenix, there we go. And some missing people, right, great. So. We're picking up a couple of differences here, so that's great. Um, the The question is, can you get them all, and can you get them all quite quickly? Right. The The answer is, yeah. The building far away that's that's a really difficult one to spot because it's in the distance, that big tower. Um, and yeah, so that's great, right? So the the, the monument, the tower is missing. So you've got some of them, but you've not got all of them, right? And to just uh, point out to you, if you look. Um, there's some metal railings missing on the right hand side around the outer edge. There's a crack in the pavement on the front that's missing on the right hand photo. There's some dots on that ring that are missing as well. And so this is actually quite a difficult challenge, right? And the people who do this sort of challenge well realize that what this is all about is that this is a challenge of memory, right? What you have to do to solve this puzzle is you have to look at the image on the left and then remember a part of that image and then transfer it to the information on the right. And so the people who do this really well, generally what they do is they tend to break their little, their information that they're memorizing down into smaller pieces. So what they do is they look at a smaller section of the photo and then go over to the right hand side, because if you try and remember too much in one go, it taxes your working memory too much. So um, it's great that you've got most of the differences, but I think, that we'd agree that this is a tough visual task, right? So now I'm going to show you a different task, and this won't be on screen for very long, okay? Oh, sorry, uh, here we go. Right. 
So what did you just see very briefly on the screen in that last slide? There we go, right? So uh, a, an orange circle moving inside uh, a blue square, okay? And if you if you remembered that, and we, yeah, great, Omar, Yannick, Ruby, you've all got that right. So an orange circle moving into a blue square. Now that image was on screen only maybe for a second or so, right? But it, what's really interesting is that if you have remembered that it's the orange circle moving into the blue square, just have a look at this. Uh, an information visualization specialist called Colin Ware has identified that there are something called pre-attentive visual properties. And what he means by that is there are things that people will notice visually without having to concentrate on them. OK, and the four pre-attentive properties that he describes are color, shape, position and movement. So when you describe the orange circle moving inside the blue square, you're actually recalling and noticing all four of those pre-attentive properties in the space of about one second. So just from a general visual perspective, one of the things that we can take away from this is, and I'm just gonna go back a couple of slides here. If your visualizations and your charts are of this sort, so this is two pie charts showing the difference in the renewable energy map between 2030 and 2050. Notice how close that is to the challenge of spot the difference, right? Like you have to remember a bit in one display and then memorize it and then carry across. It's very, very difficult for the reader when you ask the reader to do lots of remembering. And so one of the general tricks, the general tips that I would kind of make uh, out early on here is when you're presenting information, bear in mind these pre-attentive properties, because these are things that people will notice. If you make something a different color on a chart, people will, will notice it. If you make something a different shape or if you make something move, these are things that people will notice. So that's by way of a visual warm up, a welcome to the session on how charts work. And what we're going to do now is dive into a little bit more detail about what charts are for, how they work, and the different types of charts that there are, because as you can see on my kind of slide here, there are so many different ways of presenting data. Sometimes the choice can be a little bit overwhelming, you know, and 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 so um, we need some guidance on how to do that. Just to kick off with, I thought one of the things that we have when we start off with uh, charts is a sense that we need to communicate some data. So uh, this is a story that I uncovered as part of the book that I wrote, um, and it's some personal family history from the Irish census. And the census is a great source of data if you're looking into sort of playing around with data and visualizing it. Census is, is a great for, uh, source of interesting data. Now, this is data from the census of Ireland in 1901. So, and in fact, just as a little reveal here, Patrick Gallagher on this uh, census form is my great grandfather. And so on the 1901 census here, you can see that he's listed as a 26 year old cattle dealer. OK, now, one of the things the, the next key point that I want you to take when you are visualizing data is to always think about is data reliable because it's not always the case, even with something like census, because I'm going to go take you forward 10 years now to 1911. And you can see that Patrick Gallagher is now a 40 year old uh, cattle dealer. So he's aged 14 years in 10 years. Right. And uh, this actually was quite common in censuses of, the, of this era, actually, is that very often people rounded their ages because people were asked for how old are you rather than what was your date of birth? And, and so people very often would, would round up. It's something called age heaping. But I like to think that Patrick Joseph Gallagher was being just a little bit more honest on the 1911 census form, which is interesting because another piece of information that he tells us is that in 1901, he said that he could read and write. And yet in 1911, he lists himself as just being able to read. Now, what's really interesting about this is that that is an option on the census form for your education. It says, state here whether you can read and write, can read only, or cannot read. And to us these days, it seems really odd to have the, that combination of answers because you know, surely it would be either you can't read or write, or you can read and write. But there was an intermediate stage for many people where they could read, but they couldn't write. And the reason I point that out is, I think that's kind of where we are with charts. Lots of people read charts. If you think back to something like the COVID pandemic, there were charts on the TV every day, right? 
but people weren't necessarily making charts every day. Most people were reading charts rather than writing them. And so I think in terms of chart literacy, we're still behind text literacy, right? More people can read them than, than write them. Um, and the reason why I've got this screen up here is that when you do make charts, generally what you'll probably find is that you, most people at school, for example, will learn how to make bar charts, line charts, and pie charts. This is part of the curriculum. But then for many people, their chart education stops. When I say to people, when did you learn how to read a pie chart? Um, people might say seven. I was seven and I learned bar, a bar chart and a line chart as well. And then when I say, well, what was the next chart type that you learned? For many people, there is no other chart type. Those are the only three types of charts that they know. If you're lucky, someone might say, well, I did some math, so I know about scatter plots and I know, I know about a few other types of chart. But if you like, our chart vocabulary is a little bit limited in, in, in terms of our kind of overall literacy with charts. Now, one person who wouldn't be disappointed to see bar, line and pie charts on the national curriculum is someone by the name of William Playfair. He was the person who actually invented all three of those chart types back in the 18th century. So um, I don't need to teach you how to read these, like bar chart, line chart, and pie chart, right? The, the, these three fundamental forms of chart, um, he invented um, during the period of the Enlightenment that this was. So basically people were collecting data more, more than ever before. They realized that if you just presented numbers in tables of data, that it could be really difficult to read. And so Playfair was the first person to realize that actually, you know what? These charts are a great, great way of having to uh, avoid remembering lots of numbers because what the chart does is it doesn't show you all the numbers. What it does is it shows you patterns in the numbers, right? Relationships between the numbers. And he invented three chart types because he realized that these three show different things. The bar chart allows us to see how big something is compared with something else, right? At a single point in time. So this is exports and imports of Scotland to different countries around the world. Um, we can compare the size of these imports and exports. But he realized that the line chart was a much better way of showing how those have evolved over time, right? So how, how have the numbers changed over time is a very different context. And then with the pie chart, which is probably his most controversial chart of all, um, but this was to sort of show that all of these little things together make up the big thing, right? Like it was compositional, it's structure in the data. So Playfair realized this, um, but the problem is, is that if that is all you're restricted to in terms of the, the charts that you know, um, things can get boring pretty quickly. That's a common thing that people think when everything's just a pie chart or a bar chart or a line chart. Um, and also, um, they're not, there are some data which doesn't really lend itself to any of these three formats. And we'll have a look at some of that in a minute. But let's just return to the boring thing, right? Like, so sometimes, you know, I work for a news organization. And if all we did was just publish bar chart after bar chart after bar chart, people might say it's a bit boring. So what did we used to do to solve this problem? Well, I have to confess, a little bit embarrassing, actually. But um, this is what we used to do to solve the problem of bar charts and pie charts being boring right? Uh, we used to decorate them, right? And uh, so this is about 20 years old, this example from the Financial Times at the sort of end of the last century, where this kind of term infographics had started to arrive, okay? So with infographics, the idea was that, you know, you had a more kind of arresting uh, visual uh, image, something to capture someone's attention. And, and we've just talked about the importance of memorability in, in kind of visuals. I think the issue is, um, that graphic is highly memorable. Uh, so if I take it away, you probably still remember it. Um, but what do you remember about it? What was the graphic telling you? You know, you could maybe tell us in the chat if uh, if you can remember what the main message in that data was that we were just looking at. Underpants, that's exactly right, uh, Phoenix Rising. That is exactly what people remember. And this is what happens when you decorate around data is that the decoration takes over. That's right, Louise, m and sell underwear. And that would have been exactly in the thinking of the editor who commissioned this graphic at the time. Let's put the data inside a pair of underpants because m and sell underpants. But all of the reasons why we'd want to have a look at this data are kind of hidden. 
Um, and so as, as kind of crazy as this graphic is, it's utterly conventional because it's just the pi, bar and line charts that we learned when we were seven, right? Now, just a little insight from me, I think this sort of graphic simultaneously insults three groups of people at the same time, right? It insults the people who produce the data because it's basically saying, thanks for that data, that's great. Um, but to make it interesting to anyone else, we're gonna have to put it inside a pair of underpants, right? Um, it insults the reader, the FT reader, because it says, you know, your attention span is so, so short that we're going to need to put these inside a pair of underpants for you, for you to, to, to read them. Um, and then lastly, and the one that I probably care about just as much as any, is it kind of insults the visual artist. You know, that's the reason you went to art school, right? Like, that's the reason you went to art college is to be able to make a great pair of underpants like that. So, I think for all sorts of reasons that this sort of presentation of data, which we call chart junk, that's the term for it, chart junk, um, it might look fun, but be very, very wary of it because um, it, it can do all sorts of damage to the message that you're trying to convey um, and, and kind of take the attention away from the things that actually you want people to look at. So just going back to that literacy data in Ireland that I showed you right at the start, it's really interesting. Once you start to think about using different types of charts, new possibilities emerge in terms of what you can communicate to people. So this is a relatively conventional bar chart. OK, so it's what we call a stacked bar chart because you can see it's it's several bars that make up a row. So we've got the people who could read and write, the people who could only read and the people who were illiterate, and then the remainder, right? So this is all of the census data for Ireland in 1911 for the, for, the, um, for, the, for the form that we were looking at just a minute ago with Patrick Gallagher. And I was curious because I wanted to know how unusual was it for someone to be able to only read? And so you can see that's what the pale blue segment is in this chart. The pale blue is the people who can only read. Um, and you can see that I've organized the data so that it starts off with the most literate county at the top, which was Dublin, and then goes down in descending order to the least literate, which was Donegal. And so in some senses, this chart does answer my question. I can see in each county what proportion of people uh, were able to read and write or read only, and so on. But there's a nagging thing here, which is that every row here is in a county, but every county's got a different number of people living in it. Right. So what I'd be interested in knowing about is within each county, yes, how many people could read and write, but also overall in Ireland, how many people could read and write. And to do that, I can just change that chart a little bit and turn it into this chart, uh, which is something called a Marimekko chart. And you can see with the Marimekko chart, it looks a lot like the original bar chart we were looking at. But if you look at the vertical, every county is now scaled according to how many people lived in it. And so this gives us a much more interesting representation of overall who in Ireland could read and write, because that top county, Dublin, where we say was the most literate, was also the most populous. And so we can kind of see that difference, whereas you can see the, the, the smaller counties are much, much smaller in terms of overall population size. So these, these charts where you need to show, this is a chart where you need to kind of, if you like, go beyond what a pie chart can do, right? You can show a lot more information in one of these Marimekko charts um, by using these two axes. Now, how do we do this sort of thing? How does it work more generally? I mean, first thing I point out as well, I can now finally identify my, grand, my great grandfather, Patrick Joseph Gallagher on the chart, because there he is in Sligo, look, just in that little uh, pale blue segment there. So I can see that actually it was relatively unusual for someone in Sligo to be able to read only, but only through charting it like this. So that's what's called a Marimekko chart. And you can see that on my little note here, said so this is a good way of showing the size and proportion at the same time, right? So that's one of the things we want to think about. What is it that I'm trying to show? Um, once you know what Marimekko charts are, you can use them in all sorts of things, cases where that is the challenge. So this was a, a graphic that I did for the FT, where we were just looking back to the financial crisis of about 15 years ago, the, the global financial crisis. And at that time, governments bailed out the banks with uh, money. And what we ended up doing here was doing a Marimekko chart that showed on the horizontal axis 
what proportion of the country's GDP? How was what, what was what was the size of the bailout as a share of the country's GDP? You can see that that horizontal goes from zero to 100. And the vertical, rather like the island chart, the, the vertical axis shows a scale. It's the size of the economy. So at the top of the chart, you can see smaller countries like Cyprus, Slovenia, Greece and Ireland. And, and Greece and Ireland in particular, you see how that pink segment comes out quite a long way. That means relative to their GDP, the bailout was quite big, right? But if you go further down the chart, you get this really, really interesting story. Firstly, you can just understand how big that US economy is. That's the big segment at the bottom. Um, but the US was the only country that actually recovered more money uh, than it spent on the bailout as well, which is a really unusual feature of, 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 of this particular data set. And so here again, the Marimekko chart is allowing us to visualize this data in a way that we couldn't just with a pie chart or a line chart or a bar chart. Now, the secret to doing this is this thing here that we've developed at the Financial Times. It's core to how we approach the use of data in the newsroom. It's central to the book that I've written. Um, in fact, in the book that I've written, each column on this chart is a chapter. It's, it's that central to what the book is doing. But what this uh, poster does, this visual vocabulary, is it seeks to emphasize relationships in data that you want to show on a chart. And then it tells you what sort of charts might be suitable for doing that. OK, now, first thing to point out is you can get a free copy of this poster from the URL in the bottom of the slide. So ft.com forward slash vocabulary. That will allow you to get to a PDF version of the poster. And there are versions in English, French, Spanish, Chinese and Japanese um, for you to download. Um, and just to let you know how this works. So we saw Playfair's charts uh, originally. Um, look at the, the change over time column in the middle, and you can see that the line chart is the number one option there, right? So that, you know, if you want to show change over time, Playfair's line chart's a good starting point. If you want to show magnitude, which means kind of how big things are, then the column or bar chart is a good option. But you can see that there's a lot of other options too. Um, and that's what I'm just going to have a little look at now is to take a couple of those categories, the, the change over time and magnitude and, and part to hold. And let's just have a look at some examples of that. Um, so first thing that I would suggest you do with this poster is familiarize, familiarize yourself with these terms, right? because these are the relationships and the data that when you're making a chart are things that you're going to care about the reader seeing. Right. And we're going to start off with having a look at part to hold, which in in, in looking back in the history of Playfair, that's why he invented the pie chart. And pie charts are where we start this journey, because as we saw with our, uh, our kind of year seven teaching materials, they are ubiquitous pie charts. Everyone sees pie charts and they're kind of whether that's, you know, children in a classroom looking at eye color or um, sales figures um, in a boardroom. Um, kind of pie charts. Um, are everywhere. And in fact, one of the things that I think is interesting about pie charts is that sometimes they go viral on social media. So this is one from uh, Fox, uh, Fox News a few years ago, which went viral. Now, can anybody tell me why is this? Go why did this go viral? Do you think? Use the chat just to tell us what's wrong. Diagnose the problem here. Yeah, exactly. That's right, uh, Daniela, more than 100% because they don't add up. Exactly, right? So what, this for me, there's a lot of people in the data visualization world who hate pie charts, right? And I don't know if anybody, I'm trying to think of a good example, a kind of good analogy. I think I know some people, for example, who love fonts, right? Typefaces, fonts. And people who love fonts generally hate Microsoft Comic Sans, right? Uh, and, and so if you really want to upset a type nerd, send them a birthday card with the Comic Sans type on it, right? It's same with chart people, right? Chart people hate pie charts. So if you want to wind them up, send them a pie chart. But I actually think it's being a bit harsh on pie charts because the very fact that everyone knows that that's a problem tells you that people know how they work, that they should add up to 100%. And so for me, that's quite powerful, right? That's one of the reasons not to throw pie charts out is that people know how they work. But I think it's interesting to look at how do they work, right? So we know that they're a couple of hundred years old, but one of the things that hadn't happened until relatively recently was proper research into whether or not 
these pie charts work? And if so, how do they work? And so this research team um, in, in the US, Drew Scar and Robert Kazara, they did some research on the visual encodings used in a pie chart, because what they said was, well, you know, you could work out the values in a pie chart just by looking at the outer edge, if you like, the circumference, the, the arc length, or you could look at the angle of a pie chart, right? Or you could look at the area of a pie chart, but these are all encodings within a pie chart that help us to understand quantity. And so my question again for the chat, which one of these three encodings do you think the researchers suggested might be the most important method of communicating quantity, arc length, angle or area? So we've got two there for area. There's an angle. Oh, I take my hat off to Ruth, who is the first person to say arc length, which for me was the slightly surprising findings of this research, which is that arc length may well be the most influential of these three elements. Um, knowing that arc length is a driver here helps explain why I like this variation of a pie chart, right, which is something called a donut chart, which is a, a pie chart, if you can imagine, it's, it's where you knock the middle of the pie chart out. And just from a purely functional perspective, what this does is it allows you to explain what the whole is, right? So what does all of this add up to, right? What's the universe of data here? And in the case of this chart, it's all 34 clients in a report, right? That's that's what this total represents, right? So these, these donut charts are actually probably a little bit more of a functional version for me of a, of a pie chart. And if we were going to go down this route, I, I would have no problems with this sort of chart. But it doesn't stop there, right? So on the visual vocabulary, that's a donut chart, but there are problems with pie charts. And here is some data that will help show us problems with pie and donut charts, right? So I've got some data here, which is pretty recent data for those of you uh, in the UK, uh, which I think is most of you on the call. This is some data that shows the hole in the British finance, uh, public finances after the mini budget from last September, right? And so, um, you can see here that this is this is typical sort of what happens at budget time is different measures are introduced and that has the following impact on the deficit. Now, can anybody spot why this data wouldn't be very suitable for plotting in a pie chart, a pie chart or a donut chart? What is it about this data that's a little bit difficult? Yeah, it's Ruth again, uh, the negatives, right? There's lots of decimal places, definitely. And, and I love the fact that charts help us avoid precision to co concentrate on trend. But the biggest issue here is that some of those segments, some of the data elements are negative. And if you think about it, how would you show a negative number in a pie chart, right? Pie charts are kind of everything adds up to 100. But what what if it includes numbers that are negative in that calculation? That makes it very difficult. I was interested in this. I thought, what does spreadsheet software do when you do it? So I plotted it in Google uh, Sheets. And um, what we end up with is an illegal chart uh, because this yellow segment in on this left-hand side here, that's the negative 39, right? So um, Google Sheets ignores the negative, which is probably not a good thing. Right. So instead, I'm going to show you a different type of chart, which can show you how to present part to whole data when there's a negative component. It starts off with an axis that looks like a regular sort of bar or, or line chart. So we're just going to look at the size of the deficit here. And to start off with, we're going to start off with the starting point with the deficit. So this is how big the deficit was before the mini budget. Then the mini budget introduces all of these measures that increase the size of the deficit. You can see we just link and follow across, link and follow across, so the graph gradually builds up, right? Then there's a couple of other measures that are introduced in October when Jeremy Hunt first becomes the chancellor, which takes the deficit down again, right? So that's the, the negative numbers coming in, including that minus 39. And that gets us to this ending point here, right? Now, just to bring a bit of clarity to this, we can make it very clear with a timeline across the top when these things happened, and we can apply the color coding to the bars themselves. So you can see which events happened when, 
and how they added, uh, how they changed the overall deficit. And then we can put a little title on it and a little bit of kind of explanation about what this is showing. And you end up with what we call a waterfall chart. So this is for showing part to whole relationships when some of those components are negative. And I think we can agree it's probably more effective than our illegal pie chart at showing the data, right? So that's a waterfall chart. Another problem with pie charts, we saw this right at the start of this session, right? Too much remembering when you've got more than one of them. So this is a relatively simple set of charts, but already you can see that to compare the size of all of the large or all of the sum, um, you have to do some memorizing across the, 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 the charts. Now, I think there's a much neater way of plotting this sort of data, and that's to use something called grid plots, which is where you bring the charts right next to each other and use grids to show um, the, each, uh, each element of the data. Now, notice on this grid plot version of the data, how close we can put those segments together. So you can make the comparisons between the EMBA, MBA and MIM, those large segments, the sum, the none, they're very easy um, to, to, to look at and compare. So just a simple comparison, look at that, right? It, I think that's a really important functional difference, really allows you to see that difference. So that's part to whole, right? Don't, every, pie charts are not illegal, but, uh, but there are other options too. I think that's the general message here, right? Like just think about what's gonna work best in the, in, the coast, in the scope of the data you're working with. What I'm gonna look at next is magnitude. And this is just showing you some examples of where we compare the size of things. Now, people might say to me, Alan, bar charts are boring, right? I think to be brutally honest, more often than not, bar charts are boring when you plot boring data in them. And when I actually have a really simple bar chart that's got some insightful data, it's not boring. I'd honestly say that this is not a boring chart when it helps us understand the extent of the inequality in wealth in the US here, the median net worth of a family by race, right? So um, when you look at the median net worth of a white family being maybe seven or eight times higher than that of a black family, really gives us a surprising insight into to wealth in the US. That is, I think, memorable, interesting. There's nothing wrong with that bar chart, right? That's absolutely a fine way of comparing those figures visually. Um, very often with bar charts, we're plotting a kind of a total like, you know, number of people, thousands of dollars, billions of barrels of oil or, or whatever it might be. But very often we can also use bar charts to plot rates and ratios of data. And so this is a good example. This is deaths per successful ascent. Um, and again, I would say this is not a boring chart. It's a very useful chart because it's the chart I use to decide not to climb K2 because it's so de deadly, right? Like 488 successful ascents, but 92 deaths, right? It's much more dangerous than Everest. And so bar charts are really useful for just plotting pure comparisons like this, right? So um, uh, just flicking between the two, the other difference that you might notice mm -hmm. is that this chart, the bars go up, and this chart, the bars go across. Which way should you make your bar charts uh, go, horizontal or vertical? Like, who, who can tell us that, right? I'd be interested in the chat. Uh, what, what, what would you do? When do you, what do you use at the moment? Do you, do you have your bar charts go vertical or horizontal? Bilal, horizontal, why do you use horizontal bar charts? Ah, now a histogram is a very specific kind of bar chart, and we'll, we might talk about that a bit later on, but um, it looks easy to memorize. Right, I think here's my secret insight from having to, to produce charts that fit into all sorts of sizes and shapes on mobile phones, desktop computers, big newspapers. Um, bar charts are very good if you've got long labels, right? So uh, if, if you've got a long label, make it horizontal, because if you make it vertical, um, your readers might need neck surgery, right? Like a chiropractic sort of adjustment, right? So I think it, it's up to you, but if you've got long labels, just look at the benefit of being able to do that horizontally. It makes a lot more sense, okay? The thing that we always get with bar charts though, is we come back to that, Alan, I know you're telling me bar charts aren't boring, but I've seen that there's all sorts of cool data viz out there. You know, like I see bubble charts and I see all sorts of interesting stuff going on. And, um, you know, why why can't we just kind of leave the bar chart behind? Now, my sort of takeaway from this is twofold. One is 
there probably are too many bar charts in the world. And there's probably two reasons for that happening. Number one is that it's probably, this is a good example, number one, right? So this is a really, this is an interesting fact. China produced more steel in two years than the entire output of the UK since the Industrial Revolution, right? That's a really interesting fact, right? Like, I think that's interesting and insightful. Now, um, somebody uh, came up to me on the FT News desk and said, oh, it might be interesting to plot that data. And I said, really? I said, I'll plot the data for you and I'll show you the chart and you tell me whether you think it's an interesting chart. Right. So uh, I think everyone would probably agree that there is absolutely nothing that you can learn from this chart that you can't learn from the title on its own. Right. So when you've got a fact that's made of numbers, it doesn't instantly mean that you have to make a chart of it. Right. Sometimes just writing a sentence about the numbers is all you need to do. OK. And so. I would I'd be pushing back on anyone who sort of suggested that just because something has got two or three numbers in it that you've um, that you've got to do it. Time is missing in this chart. Well, it's actually encoded in the labels at the bottom. The UK measure is between is all the steel produced between 1870 and 2014, and the the measure on the right is all of the steel produced by China in 2013 and 14. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you'd had full time series data, you could have kind of of course plotted the rates to show how quickly. China had produced and caught up with that UK total. But again, in the context of a sort of pre-industrial timeline, two years would have just produced a, a line that went up vertical, right? Like, And it, it's almost impossible to see that China's ahead, actually, because the numbers are so similar. So anyway, you get my point. Sometimes you just don't need to chart it. The second time when it's, there are too many bar charts is that sometimes bar charts are not very good when there's uh, particular types of data that need plotting, right? And very often, the example that I use is ones where there's massive differences in the scale of the data. So, uh, you know, this is an obvious example in some respects, you know, just picking out the difference in the size of objects in the solar system. But you can see here, this chart kind of shows us how massive the sun is relative to everything else. But it doesn't mean it makes it very difficult for us to see what the difference is between Earth and Venus, for example, right? Like, because it's so dominated by one figure, this outlier that is the, 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 the sun. Um, and so there's different techniques that we could use to investigate this. Um, I mean, a common one I use for this sort of challenge is to go to proportional circles, right? Because these use area as the encoding, which is not as precise as a bar chart, but it does cater to ranges, uh, huge variations in data very easily. And that's not because we plot the size of planets all the time at the Financial Times, but we do things like this. How big are different pandemics and epidemics compared with each other? This data would be very, very difficult to plot in a bar chart. And so aerial comparisons work quite well. And there's little tricks that you can use. Like So you can see that on the Spanish flu circle here for 1918 of 50 million people, it's so big, we don't actually need to show all of the circle for you to get an impression of how big it is. It's kind of looming in from the left-hand side, right? But we can still make the comparison between SARS and swine flu, right? So this is a good effective technique relative to just plotting with bar charts. And another option that we kind of use is um, rather than drawing pie charts and putting underpants uh, around them, we use the artists and illustration skills now to actually encode the data itself. So, so this comparison of the size of different things relative to the, the redwood tree, I think benefits from having visual encodings of, of the thing that's being measured inside of it. Um, and you can kind of see that that's just more interesting to look at than a bar chart, but it also allows you to make the comparisons quite well. Um, and the same thing goes for this. I think that I liked this chart when we were doing coronavirus coverage, that it's the chart that explained why sneezing makes you a pariah because of just how much farther the, the droplets from a sneeze go than, than a cough. Um, but this could have just been a boring bar chart of three bars, right? Um, but using a visual encoding that kind of illustrates the data being measured really works, right? Like it, it really helps marry that kind of combination of this is interesting to look at, plus it's, it's informational. I can kind of get the information out of doing it. 
So that's the visual vocabulary in action. And, and what I would kind of encourage you to do is to just become more comfortable and confident with the range of different chart types that there are in it. And um, I think the really interesting thing with the, the, um, the, the visual vocabulary, as soon as you start to say, um, we're gonna use a wider range of chart types um, to, uh, to, to show um, our data, some people might be a little bit resistant to it, right? There's this lovely term coined by um, Martin Lambrecht, a, a data visualization person, xenographobia, which he defines as a fear of unusual charts, right? So it's people who get freaked out when you show them something that they might not be that familiar with, right? And um, one of the, the only way to confront this terrible affliction um, is to just explain to people how these lovely, beautiful new forms of chart can really help us see insight. This is, uh, does anybody know the name of this diagram? What kind of chart is this? Well done, Bilal, straight in, and Yannick, a Sankey diagram, right? So this is a Sankey diagram. And by the way, knowing the names of charts is really important. That's another thing you can use the visual vocabulary for, because it allows you to actually discuss them, right? Like imagine if we didn't know this was called a Sankey diagram. You could say, Alan, I really like that wavy, liney, kind of curvy chart that you showed us. No, like Sankey diagram. And then you know kind of what they're for. They're called Sankey diagrams because they were invented in the 19th century by an army engineer called Captain Matthew Sankey. They're designed for showing flows through systems. And in this graphic here, which shows the, 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 the flow of votes, from the first round of the French election in 2012 to the, the first round of the French election in 2017, you can see that there's some interesting patterns in here. So the thing that I point out is that Macron, who won the vote in 2017 in the first round, look at how he attracted votes from across the political spectrum, from half of his votes roughly from Hollande, but some from Sarkozy and some from people who had previously voted for Beirut. Compare that with Marine Le Pen whose voters were largely loyal to her, but she failed to attract that many votes from anywhere else. Right? So this diagram, as well as being quite attractive to look at, is also incredible because what it's showing you is a sort of matrix of flows in data, which are, would again be very difficult to encode in just a standard pie chart, bar chart, or, or, or line chart. Once you know how Sankey diagrams work, you can use them for all sorts of things, right? So. This is the, the visualization we created when the vaccination program for COVID was first um, announced. There were priority groups announced that priority group one would get it first, then priority group two. So we used a Sankey diagram to show how those groups would be formed and, and, and kind of how many were in each group and where did they come from. And, and that you can see is already a little bit more sophisticated the now voting Sankey, but Sankey diagrams can get even more sophisticated. Um, we found that out during the race for New York's uh, mayor, which produced this Sankey diagram. They have a they have a ranked choice voting system where the lowest ranked candidate drops out, out uh, at the end of each round, um, and then their votes transfer across, right? And so you can see here that we've got quite a complex Sankey that still fairly clear clearly shows what's happened. I mean, I think the thing that's really interesting, it shows you it, it, Eric Adams would have won if you'd have just stopped in round one, right? Like, but, but never mind, right? Like you have a visual explanation of how that voting process is working. And again, try to do that in a pie chart, impossible, right? So there's, there's rewards here. What I'm saying is there are lots of different chart types. Please don't ignore pie charts, bar charts and line charts because they're very conventional. People know how to read them. They are good at doing certain things, uh, but be aware when you can give the reader something more, right? Be aware when you can, because someone's going to read this and come away feeling a bit smarter. The same with the French election one. They'll, they'll understand more about the dynamics. Um, this is uh, currently live on the FT website at the moment, is our vision, part of our visualization of global inflation at the moment. And the first thing that people said to me is, Alan, you, you, there's something wrong with your map because Russia's not on it. And, and I said, well, actually, Russia is on it but this map is adjusted to show population, right? So each area on the map is scaled according to how many people live there. And it's useful in this respect because inflation is something that affects people, not grass, 
and mountains and land and physical things, right? So there are lots of parts of the world that are relatively uninhabited. And so what this, what this visualization does is it kind of shows us the distribution of people by their experience of inflation. And so Russia is on the map and it's that, that, that um, the dark blue on the furthest right-hand side of Europe, that's Russia scaled by population, right? Which you can see is not as big as people maybe expect it to be. Um, but this is something called a cartogram. And you'll very regularly see this sort of map used when things like elections come out, for example, because it's about, you know, scale by population or scale by number of votes, that sort of stuff. Right. So. Um, so, you know, a, a cartogram, very useful technique. Um, this is a really interesting chart that we produced a few years ago. Uh, U.S. life expectancy um, against uh, health spending per capita. And you can see a comparison between the U.S. here and Japan and the U.K., you can see how different US looks on this. Now, this sort of chart, it, it's a bit like a scatter plot, except we've joined the lines up, that's joined the points up with a line. It's called a connected scatter plot, and it allows us to see change over time on a scatter plot. It's a very, very useful technique. Um, one of the reasons why the US is so different is because of inequality in healthcare spending which is what this type of diagram is designed for, a cumulative curve, or more properly, perhaps, a Lorenz curve, which shows us how unequal spending on healthcare is in the US. Right? It's a very, very kind of interesting and useful way of showing inequality. Um, bump charts for showing changes in ranking. Somebody mentioned histograms for distribution earlier. They're not the only type of charts you can use for that. This is something called a bee swarm chart. Right? So I'm just flicking through these fairly quickly because I want us to leave enough time for chat and QA. And I know already we have some questions about things like software and so on, which I, I want us to get to. Um, but you can already see that if you expand your chart vocabulary, suddenly you're going to be a much more powerful data communicator. Just to finish off with, um, knowing your charts is important. Knowing how to construct your charts is, is how to design your charts, um, how to design your charts to really get messages home is also a really important thing for you to consider. Now, this is a screenshot of a chart that I took from the World Bank's website showing the proportion of seats held by women in national parliaments around the world. So can anybody tell me what the general pattern is shown by this chart? Just pop it in the in the chat. Upwards, that's right, Phoenix Rising. It's just, it's an upwards trending chart, right? So the question for me is, when you see a chart like this, people are immediately drawn to the shape. With a line chart, the steeper the line, the more dramatic the story. It looks like the trend has gone up a lot, right? But why would we be producing this chart in the first place, right? We'd be producing it because we were interested perhaps in equality. Right. And what would a quality look like in this data? Right. At the moment, it's like we're saying there's great progress. We have to compare it to the number of men. That's exactly right, Deanna. Right. Um, it doesn't show the impact of the male gender. Now, I can actually introduce the male uh, uh, data without even showing the male data, because all we could do is just switch the axis to show 50%, which would be a quality, right? And this is a, another little tip for you with charts, right? Very often we feel like we have to fill the chart with data, right? But you can sometimes, the story can be where there is no data, as in this case here, the remaining distance to equality, there's a gap. And now with this view of it, how many decades do you think it will be for us to get to 50% at the current rate? You know, a long, long time, right? And that's assuming that 50% is your target, right? Like, I mean, of course, there is a there is a context here, right? Like, um, you know, you might not be interested in equality, you might want total domination, but you can see adjusting that axis is going to uh, dramatically influence the message that you're giving. And you're absolutely right, Ruby, will it ever? Um, that's not the question asked by that chart, right? It looks like we've almost solved it already. And that's what happens when you rely on your software to pick the ranges for you. So scale matters. And I can kind of, this I think is also a very similar example looking at equality. This is a, a something called a bubble chart showing 
for the financial sector, this is a bubble chart showing the proportion of people in a bank uh, or financial institution that are women, which is the horizontal axis, and the percentage of senior roles that are held by women. And when I first plotted this chart, I thought, well, I'm going to have the equality line on both axes here. So we've got 50% and 50%. I can kind of see it, but there was something nagging at me. And in this case, the thing that nagged at me was that there's not enough of a story in how that data is arranged on screen. To get the real story in, we had to extend the axis out to 100 in both directions. And now again, can you see the story is where there is no data, which is there is not one company with more women in senior roles than men, even though lots of companies have more women than men overall in the company. Right. Uh, and so, again, this is just where the scaling can make a huge difference in the impact of, of what you present. Um, hierarchy and context. We, this comes straight back to the pre-attentive attributes I uh, explained at the start. OK, um, if everything is a bright color, no one will read your chart. Think about how you can put some things into the foreground and some things into the background, and that will allow you to explain patterns in data much more clearly. OK, um, and this kind of bright red color for Trinidad and Tobago on this chart means that that will be the first thing people look at. The final piece of advice for the for the session is to make sure that you write good charts, which might seem like an odd piece of advice, but the latest academic research suggests that titles and text are amongst the most important and memorable bits of a chart. If I give you a chart like this, what is it telling you? A bit like our World Bank example, right? Something's gone up, trend, right? We switch off from the seminar today and you have instantly forgotten that information. Right. There's nothing particularly insightful. I can transform this chart by adding about 15 words to it. Because at the moment, it just says, here are some numbers. What we want it to do is say, here is a story. And instantly, you've got a more interesting insight into what's going on with that data through a, a decent title that tells you something reliable and interesting about the data and pointing to things in the data that tell us about key events that affected it. OK, so that is the difference between here are some numbers and here is a story, because you'll probably remember that story. Uh, I was wondering who Greg was. Exactly, Ruth. Greg's is a uh, a, a fast food chain uh, that is now infamous for selling vegan sausage rolls. Famous. Um, so and just, to, you know, to show you that recipe, we use it all the time at the Financial Times. Our Instagram feed is full of charts that work like that. A proper headline telling us what this, this data is showing, clearly labeled charts, easy, standalone. On Instagram, our charts outperform our photos, which given that Instagram is a photo platform originally, kind of tells you a lot about the power of charts when you get that recipe right. So. Um, I'm delighted to say that's the end of this particular uh, slide deck. Um, uh, Siddharth mentioned a, a book that's available at the start that's out now, How Charts Work. So if you like some of the examples that I showed, many of them are in the book, but there's lots more too. Um, you can follow me on social media, but also you can follow the work of my team. So the FT Data um, Twitter account showcases all the visual and data journalism that we run at the Financial Times. Um, Siddharth, I think, has just posted a link to the, the book in the in the chat. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to pause there um, and invite us maybe to go to questions, if that's OK, Siddharth. Is that fine with you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Alan. That was, that was very informative for, for me as well. I'm pretty sure Jenny was also taking notes just like me, but just sitting here. It's, yeah, it's great to see in some of those chart types I've never even heard of. So amazing. Um, I'll hand over to Jenny because we have a couple of pre-submitted questions. So, Jenny, if you want to yeah so um the first one um which we thought was quite a good one is how can i improve my communication as a data scientist yeah i think that's a firstly whoever asked that question well done it's a great question um 
one of the things that I did before the Financial Times is that I worked for the statistics office here in the UK, ONS. And um, actually, when the phrase data scientist first came out, when it first arrived, um, I kind of had a little bit of fun with statisticians because I said, you know, data science shouldn't exist as a term because statisticians should have just evolved a little bit more. And what I meant by that was, if you look at the job description for a data scientist, invariably, it will require you to be a good communicator, to be able to communicate the insights that you uncover as part of being a data scientist and communicate that to a wider audience, you know, the board, your colleagues, the public, whoever. Um, and in the past, I don't think statisticians were particularly that good at that part of the job, right? Like they were very good at finding and, and kind of investigating and explaining things, you know, using models and tests and so on. But the, the visual uh, explanations were sometimes a little bit lacking. So um, what can you do? I mean, I think the most important thing here is to allow yourself sufficient time. I think one of the things that I find that people do is they might spend 95% of their time doing all of the analysis, right? Data sourcing analysis and kind of all of the complex coding that a data scientist will invariably get involved in um, and not leave themselves enough time at the end to think about how they can communicate it, right? So I would say build in to your way of working sufficient time for you to take this part of the job seriously. Because if you don't, you will be shortchanging yourself. Right, like you won't be doing as good a job of selling the quality of the work that you've done if you don't set aside the time to do it. Great, thank you. And I'm, I'm going to, um, the second question that was pre-submitted was uh, one that quite a few people have asked, so I'm sure you, you already expect it, but um, it's about the software that you use and if there's anything that you could recommend to the attendees that would be useful for them to use? Yeah, so software is obviously, you know, I, I always sort of joke by saying, guess which software William Playfair used, right? Um, uh, you know, I, I think there is something delicious about separating for a little while what you want to do and think about relative to the software that you're using. So when I do, I run some data visualization training sessions for the Royal Statistical Society and one of the things that I do is I have people drawing charts on a flip chart, you know, in groups. So they socialize and they talk about it and then they draft things up in pen. And that can actually be a beautiful thing to do even before you get to software. But invariably, yes, you need to use software to do it. And so um, I put off the answer long enough. The short, the short answer is we just use lots of different types of software at the FT because I've still yet to find a single thing that can do everything that I want to do, right? And that's why it's always good to start off with a picture of what do I want to do rather than what will the software allow me to make, right? So I think there was a question in the chat earlier about Sankey, Sankey diagrams, how do I make that? Now, what if the software package that I use doesn't allow me to make Sankey diagrams? Does that mean that I shouldn't make Sankey diagrams? No, it means I probably need a second tool that allows me to make Sankey diagrams. Like, so you build up like a, it's like having a, you know, maybe a plumber or a, a someone come to your house and say, well, look, I can't do that job because I've only got a spanner, right? And, and that one requires a screwdriver, right? So I would say actually build up a little toolkit. There's hundreds of data visualization tools out there. Not one of them can do everything, but if you learned how to use maybe three or four of them, then that would be a good starting point. And there are some really good shortcuts. Someone in the chat has already pointed out things like sankeymatic.com, which is a website, free website that allows you to make Sankey diagrams and it allows you to do nothing else, right? But it, it, it allows you to do it. In terms of software that you can get to now and use now, and hopefully I think probably being able to use it for free is also quite important. There's a couple of really popular tools online that people use. Um, and they're widely used in the news uh, organizations as well that I kind of deal with. Um, they are tools like Data Wrapper and Flourish. They are sort of like they have a freemium model. So you can use them for free. Um, but there's also a paid version which gets you more functionality. The thing I like about both of those tools is they will allow you to make the sort of charts that you can see on the visual vocabulary. So if you're stuck in that Excel won't let me do it sort of space, some of these tools might be a way of expanding your chart vocabulary a little bit more. Oh, thank you so much, Adam. We've got a couple questions in the Q&A section as well. 
Um, so the first one is, um, what would you suggest for a team that requests hundreds of metrics for one project? I've tried influencing them to go down a few metrics, but they want to measure everything. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, and in fact, last, last week, I spent some time working with some people who exactly have that challenge, right? They, they feel like they are at the front of a kiosk that is being bombarded with requests for metrics and data and visuals and, and all of that sort of stuff. I mean, I think, I think my answer to that, it, it's difficult for me to be comprehensive in my answer, because obviously the answer to many of these things is it depends, right? It depends on what, you know, there's presumably a reason that people want hundreds of metrics, and it might be a very good reason. But I think there's probably some things that you could start to question it up front, which is, you know, can those metrics be prioritized? Is there a hierarchy to them? Are some of them more important than others, right? Um, if you really wanted to have a fight with them, I'd be sort of saying to them, right, well, I'll give you hundreds, and then I'm going to test you on the memory of them, right? Like, so, like, how much, you know, how useful are they if you can't remember them? If you, you know, if um, uh, you know, people might think that they need hundreds because they feel like they need a safety blanket. But when you strip it down, there might be a little less that's required. Um, but very often in the past, when I've been doing things like data dashboards, one of the first things that you kind of think about is, OK, you say you need hundreds of metrics, but you can't need them all at the same level of priority. Right? There must be some that are your sort of priority or key metrics that we can promote and kind of elevate and then think about something else for the, for the less important ones. Thank you so much. And just one more, actually, um, which is, do you offer any career coaching or mentoring? <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, I think I've, I'm always happy to. We, 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 I do, like I say, I do a few things through the Royal Statistical Society. I have to say, organisations like the RSS are very, very good for networking with people who have um, career aspirations in that space not just with data visualization but everywhere else so um i am i i'm more than happy to talk to people there's probably a limit on my time at the moment which um would, would i don't want to sort of uh, sort of promise and then sort of say you know offline I, I can't um i'm more than happy to kind of field questions from people but i think one of the things you should maybe think about is the professional networks that you're going to use a couple of things that i would flag up the Data Visualization Society is a great place to develop your data visualization skills. It's got lots of networking and chat boards. It's um, it's got a magazine. It's got a, it's a great way of building your understanding of of, of the, the sort of data biz community. Um, places like the RSS are good because they offer continuing professional development in a range of kind of data science related fields. Um, and I think I mentioned earlier we do some data visualization as part of that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to chat to people, but I don't see myself as a, as a formal career mentor at the moment because the news agenda is a little bit too busy for me to dedicate as much time as I would want to it. Amazing. Well, um, yeah, if anyone has any more questions, I guess we we'll leave a couple minutes to, to send them in. But if not, um, Alan, thank you for everything once again. Um, just to let everyone know again, remind you, we will be sending you a link with the recording and, <clears throat> and a PDF of all the slides uh, later on this week. So if you have missed anything or you joined in late, it will be on YouTube. You will be able to access everything. Um, all of Alan's socials are there. And again, there's a link to the book in the chat. It is at 15% off at the moment. So if you are looking to try and pick up the book, now would be a great time. Um, it looks like we've got no more questions. So I guess we can end it there. Thank you so much again, Alan, for, for your time, for all the information. And I think looking at the chat as well, everyone seems to be very, very happy with what, what came out of it. So thanks again for everything. And yeah. um, we'll see everyone else at our next event. But have a great day. Thanks, everyone. And see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Yes.